Howdy, everybody. Oh, come on. Thank you. Good day. <laughs> Good on you. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the organizers who have been doing all the work. And most of all, thank you for showing up. It would be really weird if you weren't here. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to ruminate on protein uh, for a little bit. Um, before I get too far into it. Yeah, I'm not that kind of doctor. <clears throat> um, so nothing I say should be taken as medical advice. I'm not giving dietary advice unless you're a cow and I'm not accusing any of you being that. Um, but I have been known to say things like, um, be sure to take your daily meds, which stands for meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood. <laughs> you choose, <laughs> mix and match, whatever's appropriate. Um, by the way, all my slides have been posted on my social media accounts. So if you follow me, you can download them from there, individual JPEGs as well as PDFs. Uh, if you don't follow me, you'll see the accounts listed later. So um, all protein is not created equal. We've heard a lot about protein already, and it's been wonderful because I've been like, okay, I don't have to talk about that. I don't have and yeah, the, the, the closing message from the previous talk about not outsourcing your health, amen. Um, so, you know, we're concerned, we're interested in protein, and that's entirely appropriate. But we don't frequently, it's misunderstood. We don't understand the terms and the nuances, and then that ends up with um, poor health, it ends up with flawed dietary advice, misguided food policies, and misguided uh, environmental considerations. And so I'm gonna blitz through a bunch of stuff here. I've got my goals, which are what is crude protein and why is that important? Um, I wanna emphasize the point that humanity's diet is already plant-based in the face of all the conversation and I think that's the problem, um, that uh, we need to uh, talk about intake targets, minimal versus optimal. Um, protein isn't created equal, so we have to talk about protein uh, quality uh, estimations. Um, you know, when we process food, we have an effect on protein availability, and plant source foods differ in their response to processing compared to animal source foods. This isn't frequently understood. Um, and of course, we're not merely talking about protein because protein foods, especially from a uh, animal source foods, provide lots of essential nutrients. Right? Uh, we, we, we tend to devolve the conversation and only look at one factor when in fact um, it's much broader than that. And then impacts upon environmental issues. So I hope your seatbelt's buckled because we're gonna go through some of this pretty fast. Um, so when you look on a label or you look in a table, when you see that term right there, protein, that's crude protein. Animal scientists understand this. We've been looking at food, subs, food feeds since 1880 using proximate analysis, uh, but that's not true protein. It's a value of minimal value to human nutrition or other monogastrics. Um, now, if this is news to you, I can assure you I've had some wonderful responses from some other folks who it came as news to them. And, and we got to have that conversation. So what's crude protein? It's not true protein. It in fact is the percent nitrogen in a sample times 6.25. So that's the conversion, okay? Um, it assumes that all the nitrogen that was there was in protein and that all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Okay, that's the logic behind it. It works okay with ruminants, not so good with monogastrics like us, <clears throat> but some proteins contain more or less than 16% nitrogen, and different foodstuffs contain varying amounts of non-protein nitrogen. So if you have a green leafy vegetable that's got a lot of nitrate, that nitrate is gonna be expressed, that nitrate nitrogen is gonna be expressed as crude protein. It's not protein, 
okay? And plants are higher in these non-protein nitrogen sources than, okay. Um, differences between crude protein and true protein are greater in plant source foods than animal source foods. And true protein from animal source foods contains a higher proportion of nutritionally essential amino acids. We've heard about this already. Again, the slides are posted, so don't worry. I'm going to upset you if you're trying to take pictures. Um, and I don't want to do that. I want to be a good guest. So we treat foods whether, at, almost on an equivalence basis. So we talk about calories. We talk about protein, and we talk about protein on a mass basis. Or we talk about minerals or other nutrients. And plant source foods and animal source foods are not equivalent. So why, when we have food system conversations, do we treat them as if they are? Why, when we have dietary conversations, do we talk about protein as if protein from plants is equivalent to pro, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> Moving right along. So humanity's diet is already plant-based. Okay, the vast majority of whether, whether you wanna look at fat, which is the bar closest to me, or food supply in terms of calories or protein, which is furthest away from me, the majority of all of those are coming from plant sources. Okay, this is global data. Of course, there are regional differences, and of course, if we broke those out and looked more closely at a region, we'd see differences. <clears throat> but note that none of those regions exceeds 30% of calories, in this case, coming from animal source foods. Keep that in mind. It'll come back. Okay, no, number two is, of course, what colors was I gonna use for the bars when I made these graphs? <laughs> right, green and red, right, green for plants, right? Because that's, it's green. Well, is it? Let's look at the data. Here we go, this is the energy supply broken out into the different categories. You'll note that the largest supply of calories in humanity's diet is wheat and products, second is rice and products, and the third is sugar. We're well over a third. Then the fourth is maize, which I call corn and products. We're over 40% of calories in humanity's food supply coming from plants, and none of them are green. Maybe amber waves, you know? <laughs> Maybe that would be a better color. Okay, and then we finally get to milk as the fifth leading source of calories in humanity's diet. How about protein? Wheat and products at 19%, rice and products at 12%, and then milk excluding butter at 10%. Again, green and red don't seem appropriate when you drill into the data. So next, intake targets, minimal versus optimal. So here we see similar data. This is from a few years ago, but Again, we're stacking the animal source on the bottom, green source on the top. We're just looking at protein, and I'm making sure people understand it's crude protein. Okay, there's, there's no adjustment here for, for quality. And then we can draw this you know, line across at 0.8 grams per kilogram, and this is for the increasingly endangered and rare 70 kilogram individual. <laughs> And we see where that lies in terms of these regions, okay? And there's evidence that says maybe we should be more like 1.2 or 1.6, as we heard yesterday. Well, you start, see, what we fail to frequently understand is that the RDA is, in fact, not a target, it's a minimum. And too many of us, or, and others, <laughs> think it's the target. But the other point here is that's an amount of high, of reference protein. That's a term of art within the, the guild. And what that means is highly digestible, high quality protein such as eggs, meat, milk, or fish. Back to the daily meds, right? Okay. Um, but you gotta dig a couple footnotes levels in to see that. Hasn't changed much for over 70 years, might be time. Um, current evidence indicates intakes in the range of at least 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram per day 
of high quality protein is more ideal target for achieving optimal health outcomes in adults. Again, we have this difference between adequate and optimal. <laughs> and I'd really like to pursue optimal, right? I just think that's a goal that we should be all striving for. Well, okay, so remember, we're not expressing quality differences properly and we're driving towards a minimum instead of a optimal level. Um, why is this important? Well, this is NHANES data from the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, US data, sorry, I'm American. Um, and their data, when they showed it, this is their figure, shows that 40%, over 40% of Americans don't get enough protein. Again, they're counting all protein, plant and animals, if it's equivalent, and they're looking at an RDA. <laughs> okay, and 40% don't meet those two low targets. Okay, and most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough, and they're still capable of looking at their own, these data, and saying that protein is not a nutrient of concern. Moving right along. So average daily per capita protein consumption relative to average daily protein requirement. Now this is for the lowest income countries and territories. This is Moen's work from 2021. I will try to get the references posted. Um, didn't get it done, sorry. Um, and so you have the countries as stack bars from lowest closest to me across. Again, we've stacked with green at the bottom and whatever that orangish color is on top is animal. And there again is that mythical line of requirement. <laughs> and you see people look at this and they say, oh, well, only the very poorest countries see protein supply as a problem. Well, what happens if we correct for digestibility? Just digestibility now. So just because it's in a food doesn't mean we can absorb it. When you correct for digestibility, you see that shifts that picture just a little bit, doesn't it? And just because you absorb it doesn't mean you can utilize it. Globally, lysine is a limiting amino acid. That's got a lot to do with the fact that wheat and rice are our single largest sources of protein, and, and they're poor sources of lysine. Okay, so based on the available utilizable lysine in these brothers and sisters food supply, none of them are getting enough. Looks a little different than it did before. This is why these metrics matter. <clears throat> so protein isn't created equal. In 2011, we had this expert consultation of the Food and Agriculture Organization made these recommendations. Dietary amino acids should be treated as individual nutrients and wherever possible, data for digestible or bioavailable amino acids should be given in food tables and on an individual amino acid basis, right? When you see protein, that's sort of this bucket doesn't tell you nearly enough information. Recommended that a new protein quality measure, DIAS, replace PDCAS. Don't wanna to get too much in the weeds on this, but the dige protein digestible corrected amino acid score, PDCAS, has three significant limitations and they've known this from the start. It overestimates the protein quality of plant source foods and it underestimates the value of protein from animal source foods. It tr by truncating those animal source foods at 100. Because in, in their scenario, in their logic for that, they said nothing can be more than 100 because they can't get to the combining of foods with PDCAS. And uh, of course, it has no ability to look at bioavailability. So the digestible, indispensable amino acid score, DIAS. If we compare the two, PDCAS uses rat fecal digestibility versus DIAS, which uses pig ileal digestibility. So actually seeing how much disappeared between the mouth and the ileum without any contamination in the large intestine or cecum looks at individual amino acids, DIAS does, PDCAS doesn't, 
Um, there's three scoring patterns for dias because our needs for individual essential amino acids changes as we go along through life. Uh, PDCAS only uses one. There's no truncation of value for dias. So there's the ability to look and say, if I add some more dairy to a cereal, I can balance out the, the lack of certain amino acids in the cereal. Okay, so now we, can, we have a tool to allow us to do that. But by looking at these foods with greater sophistication, these are plant source foods that are frequently thought of as being good sources of protein, right? Hello? <laughs> okay. But even per PDCAS, almonds, sunflower seeds, and peanut butter don't qualify to be a good source of protein. And we shouldn't be using PDCAS anymore, so if we use DIAS, only chickpeas qualify. Changes things just a little bit. I'm absolutely convinced that a lot of people think they have the information they need to achieve what they're trying to achieve, but they don't realize what they don't know, and of course none of us do. Um, so to pick up the stick again and beat the dietary guidelines in the United States, they base everything on this idea of ounce equivalence of, and again, protein, right? Because I just want to keep hammering that that's not protein. Okay, so an ounce of meat is the equivalent of a cooked, is an equivalent amount of protein that you would get from a cooked egg or a quarter cup of red kidney beans or a teaspoon, tablespoon of peanut butter or two ounces of tofu or half an ounce of mixed nuts. Who here eats a half an ounce? <laughs> you know, I had to learn that a handful of nuts was not the amount I could physically hold. Well, somebody finally thought to check them on their work. Uh, the metabolic equivalency of these varied protein food sources has not been established. Uh, the basis for considering these protein food sources to be equivalent is unclear. These equivalent protein food sources do not appear to be equivalent in any respect. I checked the U.S. dietary guidelines, which were in effect from 2020 to 2025. I did a search of the PDF. The, the acronym DIAS does not appear. And the phrase amino acid only appears four times, each time in the title of, a, of the same title of a reference that's cited in four different tables that are talking about caloric intake. That's their discussion of amino acids. Weird, huh? Okay, so processing affects plant source foods versus animal source foods. First lesson is plant source foods are far more va variable in their nutrient content than animal source foods. Uh, here's uh, from looking at almost 6,000 samples of soybeans, the crude protein varied by uh, as much as 20% and individual am amino acids could vary by as much as 45%. I guarantee you they don't test each lot when they run the next batch. They don't print a new label. So people are spending a lot of time tracking things and I'm gonna say their data is probably organic fertilizer at this point. Um, <laughs> wheat is the single largest source of protein, crude protein in humanity's diet, and yet it can vary from 9 to 15% crude protein because of market class, right? Different classes of wheat have different protein levels. Okay, it's a poor quality protein source, as you can see by looking here, dias values, birth to six months, six months to three years, three years and above, we're just barely above a 50% on the dias score for wheat, and it's lysine limiting. But when we process it, we make it worse. You know, when you make toast or you make something brown and crispy, that's a chemical reaction between lysine and sugar that makes that lysine virtually unavailable. And so if we make it really brown and crispy, like in a breakfast cereal, we virtually eliminated all the lysine. Now, if I were to put real dairy on that instead of some plant juice beverage, 
there might be enough lysine to overcome the deficiency from the cardboard, I'm not, sorry, the breakfast cereal. <laughs> and I'm not recommending breakfast cereal, I'm just throwing it out there. Okay, but that does not happen with animal source foods. In fact, ironically, when we process these animal source foods, we increase its dye ass value. So I can take trimmings from, you know, cutting up beef roasts and make bologna out of it and increase its value. So processed animal products are not the same as processed plant products. <clears throat> okay, uh, nutrition, obviously we're getting more than just amino acids. Um, and, you know, animal source foods part of a balanced Diet, I'm going to suggest that they're the foundation of a balanced diet. Cordain looked at ancestral diets going around the world for hunter-gatherers, surveyed how much of their caloric intake is coming from animal source foods, found a range from 30 all the way up to 100% with a mean around 70%. Remember that line that went across the food supply? Nobody's at 30%, and certainly in the US, we're right there. <clears throat> and then Nordhagen and others found that we get rapidly increasing deficiencies in populations when we get below 30% of calories coming from animal source foods. And then View and, his co and their colleagues said that you know if you're getting less than 50% of your total protein from animal source foods, you're not going to be meeting your non-protein nutrient requirements. Now, supplementation is something that those in the wealthy countries can entertain as a notion. We can question how effective that is, but it's certainly not an option in the low and middle income countries. And in particular, a diet that's low in animal source foods typically results in low intakes of bioavailable iron and zinc, calcium, retinol, uh, vi vitamin B2, B6, B12. <clears throat> it has an environmental impact. Because if we're talking about crude protein yield as opposed to essential amino acid yield, that shifts the conversation. And you can see how much it shifts the conversation in the next three slides when we talk about crude protein closest to me and you compare wheat, rice, maize, eggs, pork, and milk to lysine yield from the same. And you look here in terms of area per ton or area per kilogram, but it brings the animal source foods into greater alignment with the plant source foods. Here's wa fresh water use, shifts the conversation just a little bit, doesn't it? And then here's greenhouse gas emissions. Again, it shifts the conversation dramatically. And of course, we're not only getting essential amino acids, we're getting all the nutrients. So if we start saying, how much would we have to eat to get a third of our requirements, and what's its greenhouse gas emissions? And <clears throat> there's refined grains at the top. Here's liver at the bottom. Shifts the conversation when we use appropriate metrics. Oh, and speaking of metrics, we've been using the wrong metric to estimate the global warming potential of the enteric from burp methane from ruminants. Only by a factor of three to four times. <laughs> While at the same time, we've been underestimating the impact of fossil methane emissions. Shifts the conversation. Now, Climate change is a problem. It's not our only problem. And right now we are in a global pandemic of malnutrition and the diseases that come from it, and that's unsustainable. What's the impact of the healthcare industry? Remind me, I'll come back to that. Um, we upcycle the resources that we feed to animals. So what they consume becomes a product that's more valuable to us than the original product. Here's another example. US, when we feed corn as part of a ration in the finishing phase, <clears throat> which is 10% of the lifetime feed that a steer consumes, they yield 240 times more utilizable lysine than they consume. That sounds like a good deal to me. Okay.
So I've covered these points. Crude protein, it's already a plant-based diet. How much worse do you want it to be? We've got a fifth of women of childbearing age in the US and UK being anemic. We've got between a fifth and a quarter of children five and under being stunted due to a lack of the essential nutrients best provided by animal source foods. 60% of children zero to 64 months. No, that can't be right. 36 months. When the WHO says that they should be getting meat, eggs, dairy, seafood as the best source of the essential nutrients they need, 60% per UNICEF aren't getting meat, eggs, dairy, seafood in their diet. So whatever y'all want to entertain in your wealthy country, in your very capital, you know, just whatever, you do you. Leave the rest of my brothers and sisters alone. Humanity's existential crisis is, in fact, insufficient animal source food. That existential crisis thing gets overused. But it's very clear that the malnutrition that we're experiencing is from not enough. And we have the highest quality scientific evidence that points to that. And anything that speaks to harm to humans from eating too much is myth. It, it's based on the weakest quality evidence that we have. It's nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. It's based on a lot of other things. It's harmful. You can tell when idols are being worshiped because human beings get sacrificed. So here are my social media accounts. I'm here throughout the rest of the time and I look forward to Q&A or comp, please talk to me. I've had some wonderful conversations already. I'm trying to build bridges between my agricultural tribe and your, our tribe here, because I think we have a great deal we can learn from each other and we must learn from each other because it's not, nobody's coming, <laughs> right? Nobody's coming to save us. It's up to us. We can do it, and if I can help give you information that answers the concerns that you or your clients might have, please feel free to contact me because that's my whole role now. Thank you.